Welcome to Mr. True Crime. Today's video is an in-depth look into the trial of John C. Colt, is a tale of ferocity and intrigue. If you're intrigued by anything dealing with death, feel free to click off this video. Perhaps check out my gaming channel, Retail Me Games, for some lighthearted content. If not, I'm Nicole. Let's get started. Elisha Collier patented a revolving flintlock, a mechanism using muskets and rifles, in 1814. By 1836, Samuel Colt had improved upon his invention and patented his mechanism that would enable guns to fire multiple times without reloading. Though his business failed at first, the Colt's Patent Arms Manufacturing Company was enlisted to produce revolvers for the Mexican and Civil War. Colt went on to produce and create the Colt 45. 45 caliber peacemaker, and the first remote-controlled naval mine explosive. While he was busying himself with different business ventures, his older brother John was enduring a venture of his own, one he wouldn't come back from. Described as being about 5'11", firmly built, though slender with a large head, oval face and light complexion, John C. Colt was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1810 to businessman Christopher Colt and Sarah Caldwell Colt the third child and eldest son. Together the couple had eight children, though two died young and their eldest daughter Margaret succumbed to tuberculosis as a teen. When John was nine, he was sent to Hatley, Massachusetts to study at Hopkins Academy. He often acted out and three years later he was taken to Vermont to learn farming from his uncle. During his transition in 1821, his mother Sarah died at 40 from tuberculosis. With only four children remaining, John became extremely close to his last surviving sister, Sarah Ann Colt. She was described as proud, sensitive, and quiet, but she protected her brothers and encouraged them as a mother would. Despite her motherly intentions, her father pursued a proper woman to mother his children and remarried Olivia Sargent. Described as quiet and energetic woman, Olivia was 35 and the daughter of a wealthy mechanic. During the Panic of 1819, the Colt family filed bankruptcy. And to ensure a brighter future, Olivia thought it was best that the children worked rather than go to school. John's requests of military school at West Point and Captain Park Ridge Military Institute were denied, and at 14, he worked as an assistant bookkeeper at the Union Manufacturing Company at Marlboro, Connecticut. From there, he ran away to Albany, New York, then returned to Hartford in 1826 and studied at an academy for three months. In 1827, he disappeared to Baltimore, Maryland, where he taught math at the Girls' Academy. The following year, a man named Everett employed John as an engineer for a canal in Longshores, a place 15 miles from Wikes Barrow, Pennsylvania. This lasted seven months. Over the course of his career adventures, he wrote to his sister Sarah Ann, until soon in 1829 the letter stopped. Sarah Ann Colt committed suicide at the age of 21. The cause behind her demise are unclear but the why didn't matter to John, who enlisted as a Marine soon after. Over a short time, John became dissatisfied with the Marine life and fell ill, being bedridden in a hospital. During his hospital stay, he thought of ways to get out of his predicament. He eventually forged a letter by his father to Colonel Anderson and was discharged. Afterwards, he spent a year as a law clerk, then as a math teacher and debate coach at the University of Vermont. After many more adventures and career opportunities, Colt landed in New York as a bookkeeper once again. The year is now 1840, and John C. Colt is 30 years old. He went to an office in Manhattan on the corner of Broadway and Chamber Street with Asia Willer, a writer and bookkeeping teacher, and was playing house with Caroline M. Henshaw. She was described as uneducated, yet beautiful. A year after their courtship, Caroline fell pregnant. With a new baby and new office, John seemed to have things looking up for him after many career failures, but he would soon be his own undoing. Samuel Adams, not to be confused with the political philosopher or one of the founding fathers, was a printer who printed Colt's textbooks, a teacher's and clerk's edition, and a school edition. On Friday, September 17, 1841, Samuel entered the office. The cause of his visit was money-related. 
While one source claims it was a discrepancy of $1.35, another puts the difference at $15.35. The conversation became heated with Adams calling Colt a liar. Soon, Colt received a bloody nose. He then began to punch Adams, who then grabbed Colt's scarf and twisted it until Colt could barely breathe, pushing him against a wall. Defensively, Colt grabbed what he assumed to be a hammer from a nearby table and attacked Adams in the head five or six times until Samuel Adams dropped to the ground, dead. During his trial confession, Colt said, The blood at this time was spreading all over the floor. I tried to stop it by tying his handkerchief around his neck. This appeared to do no good. After taking his handkerchief off and his stock too, I think, it was then I discovered so much blood, and the fear of its leaking through the floor caused me to take a towel and gather with it all I could, and rinse it in the pail which stood in the room. I did as still and hastily as possible. I took my seat near the window and began to think what it was best to do. While he busied himself cleaning up the blood of his employer, someone knocked on his office door, but he ignored each rattle. Satisfied with the state of his office, Colt left the building and went to see his brother, who was nearby, to confess his misdeed. But his brother was talking to someone, so he changed his mind. He then considered going to the magistrate, but didn't want to ruin his family's reputation, so he returned to his office. After thoughts of burning down the building passed, Colt concluded there was only one solution. In his own words, It occurred to me that I might put the body in a cask or box and ship it somewhere. I little thought at this time that the box that was in the room would answer. I went and examined the box to see if I could not crowd the body into it. I soon saw that there was a possibility of doing so if I could bend the legs up. It occurred to me if I bury or send the body off, the clothes he had on would establish his identity. It became necessary to strip and dispose of the clothes. Colt removed Adam's clothing, piling his keys, watch, and other belongings on a table to be later disposed of. He then tied rope around Adam's knees, another around his neck connecting to his knees, and pushed the body together. He slid the body into the box, standing on Adam's knees to push him all the way inside, and left him for the night. The following morning, he bought nails and nailed the box shut, and hurried downstairs paying a random man 10 or 12 cents to help get the box downstairs. Colt marked the box to be shipped to St. Louis from a fake address in New Orleans on the packet Kalamazoo. He hired a carman to take the box and ship it to his destination. For all intents and purposes, John Colt had gotten away with murder. After 24 hours, Adam's family began to worry. His wife had taken ads in the city newspaper to locate her missing husband, but to no avail. Going on as normal, Colt traveled to Adam's print shop to inquire about his textbooks, in which Adam's bookbinder stated that the last anyone saw of his boss, he was heading to see Colt. Colt ignored him and left the shop. Soon, Adam's friends and employees searched his records to determine his whereabouts, taking their findings to the mayor, who spoke to witnesses that saw Adams enter Colt's building, and Colt pay a carman to take away the crate the following day. The mayor, Adam's comrades, and the New York police located the carman, who located the crate, and together all boarded the Kalamazoo. The Kalamazoo had been in port for a week because of heavy rain. This weather caused the body to decompose and unleash a foul odor. Thinking the smell was rat poison, the crew was surprised when they opened the crate on official orders and found a half-naked corpse. Only a gold ring and an unusual scar on his leg identified Samuel Adams. Six days after the murder, John C. Colt was arrested and sent to the tombs. As the trial began January 21, 1842, Colt realized he wasn't as thorough with his crime as he earlier thought. On the day of the murder, his employee, Azure Willer, had heard a noise in Colt's office that led him to investigate. He looked through the keyhole and saw two men's hats on the table and a man bending over something. Either he or the student he was with went to find help, reports differ but no help returned. Still, Willer tried to look again, but the keyhole was now closed, and no one answered his knocks. Barring a key the following morning, Willer peered inside Colt's office, knowing the freshly scrubbed floors, missing large box, and splashes of fresh ink and oil on the walls. Willer asked Colt about the noises later, but he denied being in the building, but then said he was just upset at his writing table. Other witnesses proclaimed hearing the sounds of scrubbing and hammering from his office. The building's janitor recalled seeing Colt move a large crate down the stairs. 
The hired hand testified that he was paid to move the same box to the packet. While it became clear that Colt had murdered his employee, what the prosecution had to prove was whether the murder was premeditated. The evidence that entered the courtroom was the box the body was packed in, Adam's watch, and a small hatchet. Perhaps because of who John's brother was, prosecution introduced a theory that Adams may have been killed by a Colt revolver. Expert witnesses testified that the wound on Adam's head could be from a ball fired from an air gun, which would produce a round hole, as was found in the skull, and account for the sounds Willer heard. The defense, which consisted of Colt's cousin Dudley Selden, and defense attorneys John Morrell and Robert Emmett, called Samuel Colt to the stand to demonstrate whether or not a gun could have been the weapon. In the demonstration, the gun was loud, but was only able to penetrate a few pages of a book. In one experiment, he caught all five balls in his hand. To further demonstrate the cause of death, they severed Adam's head from his corpse and brought him into the courtroom to be examined by the defense's physicians. They concluded the wound was consistent with the hatchet brought in as evidence. To testify in Colt's behavior, Caroline Henshaw was called to the stand. She described Colt coming home with the black bruises on his neck on the night of the murder. Henshaw went on to contend that Colt was a mild-mannered man. Numerous witnesses agreed with her characterization of her common-law husband, though others detailed Colt as being irritable whenever money was involved. Colt said that though he did kill Adams, he acted in self-defense, while his defense argued that the concealment of the body was an act of temporary insanity. The most compelling testimony was a detailed statement written by Colt that his defense read before the court. In it, he confessed to the murder, while detailing what exactly happened in his office, his thoughts throughout and the aftermath, and why he killed Samuel Adams. Attorney Robert Emmett argued that the markings on Colt's neck that Henshaw described confirmed that Adams had tried to strangle Colt. If the markings coincided with strangle marks, then Colt acted unjust, and the murder was justifiable homicide. Nonetheless, the jury had the final say, and they found Colt guilty of willful murder. After many failed attempts to appeal, Colt was sentenced to be hanged on November 14, 1842. Caroline and John requested to be married prior to the execution, and their wish was granted. Hours before Colt was to be killed, the pair were married by the Reverend Mr. Anton. Caroline wore a straw bonnet, green shawl, claret-colored cloak, trimmed with red cord and muff. The witnesses to the ceremony were Samuel Colt, John Howard Payne, David Graham, Robert Emmett, Justice Merritt, and the Sheriff. Afterwards, the couple were permitted an hour alone. When the hour was up, Colt was left alone upon his request, and as the hours ticked down, a fire soon broke out in the tombs. Many scrambled to put out the fire, and once it was under control, authorities went to retrieve Colt for hanging, but there wasn't a need. On the floor of his cell, John C. Colt lay with a dagger in his heart, his hands crossed over his stomach. His body was soon taken and buried at the St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. After his death, rumors speculated that Colt had killed another prisoner and dumped his dead body in his place and escaped during the fire. Years later, another rumor surfaced that he was living in California with Henshaw. Neither claim has ever been proven true. What has been proven was that Caroline Henshaw wasn't a stranger to the Colt family. She met Samuel Colt at the age of 16 in Scotland, and the two were married, but Samuel began having second thoughts about their arrangement and quietly abandoned her. She later meets John, and the two live together and a son is born in December 1841, named Samuel Caldwell Colt, who I'll call Junior to eliminate confusion. Historians determine, based on family letters, that John's marriage to Caroline was a way to legitimize her son, who happens to belong to Samuel Colt, revolver maker. After his brother's death, Samuel took care of Junior, calling him nephew, paying him large allowances and paying his tuition. When Samuel Colt died in 1862, he left Junior was equivalent to two million dollars. Samuel's wife protested these allegations, but was quickly silenced when proof of a marriage certificate was put forth. Junior lived in Connecticut as a farmer and state official and died in 1915. Caroline Henshaw is said to have changed her name to Julia Leakister and married Frederick von Oppen. At the time of John Colt's death, he was survived by his brothers, attorney James Colt of St. Louis, Samuel Colt, and Christopher Colt, who was a merchant. It was said that John showed no remorse during his trial, despite his pleas and attempts at an appeal. 
the occult made headlines for his misdeeds. The life of the man he slayed fell by the wayside. Samuel Adams was a printer and was married, but what else? The information I'm providing to you is the information I could find. Too often we remember the killer and not the killed. Can we name the victims of the Columbine shooting? Or the victims of serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer? Or more recently, the victims of the Waffle House Massacre? These people had stories. They had a life. And it was cut short. And instead of asking who they were, we asked who killed them. I'm Mr. True Crime. And remember to be kind, be loud, be aware. For more information about the murder of Samuel Adams, why not check out some of his awesome links? And if you like what you saw and heard today, why not drop a like and a comment? Maybe subscribe while you're here? <laughs> I make new videos every Tuesday and Friday, and you don't want to miss what's in store.